Okay, we're back here live in Las Vegas for IBM's Information on Demand. The hashtag is IBM IOD. And if you want to participate in the conversation, go to crowdchat.net slash IBM IOD. We'll be documenting all the epic tweets and posts on LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Amjo, my co-host Dave Vellante. And our next guest on theCUBE is Harriet Fremen, the director of Big Data and Analytics at IBM. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much. So, uh, Asli, we just had a, a great chat with um, Tim Buckman, where he's talking about uh, I mean, just many use cases of, of the the business model of delivering healthcare, but a lot of the operational. Um, you know, some of his epic epic sound bites are situational awareness, data in motion, data flow patterns. Um, these these are these are the insights. So, talk about IBM's uh, positioning here today. Last year we were here. Big data is being integrated in. IBM's all these assets. Now you guys seem very unified around those key areas of data analytics and social business, while under the hood you got cloud and mobile, which is, is the engine providing it all. What's the, what's the corner, what's the, what's the key thoughts here for the folks to yeah, take away? Yeah, sure. So we really have looked at the four technology disruptors in the market today, the, the, the social um, move, which is really a, a new way that people are going to be interacting and making decisions. We have uh, the, the mobile, so everybody's mobile. We need to take advantage of understanding where they are in order to use analytics to better serve them um, in their location, as well as that being another great source of data. And then we have cloud, the ability to uh, deliver analytics, big data, wherever people are, data born on the cloud. And really what we see with big data and analytics as our fourth area is, how can we put all of that to good use? For example, as you said, in, in, in different industries, healthcare, retail, uh, industrial, et cetera, so that we can really help people get the insights they need and help them apply it where it really matters in their business. Talk a little bit about the relationship between those four pillars. How do you look at the interrelationship? Yep, yeah, we see them very much as fueling each other. So where uh, social can be a great source of information, what people are thinking, what people are talking about, what their preferences are, what their sentiments are, that's a great source of information that can help fuel and augment what enterprises have inside their enterprise. So we see social as a fuel for big data and analytics, as well as big data and analytics fueling that social interaction. So very much there's an interweaving in each of those four areas with each other. So yeah, the social, now help, help me understand the, your thinking on this. Social data is some kind of fuzzy, right? Yeah. Sentiment, I'm inferring. How do you go from that level of, of, of interaction to something that you can put more confidence in. Talk about how IBM approaches that. Sure, well, we have many uh, organizations that are using analytics on their enterprise data to look at uh, sales trends, look at uh, financial status, the cost and, and profit equations, using really enterprise structured data. And where social data comes in is it really helps people understand what's happening in the world around them. You've heard the phrase, you know, the world is getting instrumented, right? Mm. So we ourselves are getting instrumented in that everything we say, we tweet about, is, uh, is a source of information. And if we can look at that and tie that information to the structured data, we get new insights. So let me give you an example. I may be a brand manager and I'm looking at my product sales uh, with my internal ERP data and it's not looking good, let's say. And I go, well, why are those product sales in trouble? I could look internally at my manufacturing, my inventory levels, or the structured information I used to look at. But really what may be happening is there's another brand out there, another product that's competing with me that people are chatting about, they have great sentiment about that product, and actually that's hurting my product sales. So if I can get my arms around what people are saying in the marketplace, understand the text, whether it's positive or negative, the sentiment, what people are talking about, and I can tie that to uh, my internal data, I can now work out the levers I need to have in marketing and sales and service to build my reputation and be able to tie what people are saying about me in the marketplace to what's happening internally. Or make an offer. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> make a real-time offer, that would be great. Harriet, Dave and I coined the term crowd consumer, and crowd consumers is what we've been talking about in our research around this new consumer category that's out there. That's on the go, you just mentioned the world around. This is a yeah. new phenomenon. This is not like, it hasn't really, I mean, there's always been people out there, it's always been kind of you know, out of band, half your advertising, you don't even know what you're spending it on as the old, old adage goes. But now, with instrumentation of social data, mm -hmm. social business, um, that analytics is very important. So, so I have to ask you, one, um, this new consumer is now part of the, of the activities. They're either buying directly, they're participating with sentiments so you can listen to the customer. Uh, I mean, you can actually listen to the customer. 
for the first time in the history of the world, right? Yep. Directly. So um, how does that change from a product standpoint, looking back at the historical data world, business intelligence data warehousing have been slower, mostly fenced out organizations, stored on big tape backup. Now that data needs to be real time. So explain to the folks what's different about big data analytics in the impact to the business owner, yeah, the enterprise, the business owner saying, I want value. I think mo every business owner and leader that I talk to in my discussions really know that there's value in big data, but they don't know where that value is or how to find it. And so we really see a shift happening both in the big data side of things and in the analytics side of things. So in analytics, people typically frame of reference is that historical reporting, as you said, the way to sort of look back in time and sort of have digest the information more as a strategy and management process. And really, if we're going to take advantage of that data community out there, we need to think more dynamically. We need to think first um, in real time. How can I understand what's happening right now to change the outcome before, um, before it sort of trends down or, or trends away I don't, I don't want it to? So definitely, uh, you talked about the sign about, about real time. We see where big data and analytics comes together the most is in real time, and that's why we've invested in Infosphere streams, that's why we've in invested in, in predictive analytics in those streams, so that we can say, and we can monitor when something's happening in real time, we can assess it, we can predict what the outcome might be, and we can suggest the next best action, a coffee coupon like you suggested, the next best action, which is gonna have a direct positive impact on the business, versus a month from now going, Oh, I, I wish we had sort of solved those customer churns a month ago. <laughs> Tim was mentioning about his uh, his uh, old his dad used to take him on Sunday drives, and that was his analogy he used. And, and essentially, what he said was they went, they wanted to go from point A to point B. They kind of knew they wanted to do that, but there's a lot of different choices to make. And you know, most businesses say, "Hey, I want to increase sales." And they kind of know where they want to go, but there's a lot of different choices. How is the analytics side of of, the, of, the, of your product offering and solution set addressing that? Hey, I don't want to actually have to to use the good to great analogy where you get on the bus. You have the right people, but ultimately you might have to change roads uh, to get there. Mm -hmm. So data will be a key part of that versus a prefabricated, here's the path, and, and it may or may not be there. So like, what is the, what is the key uh, product and solutions that you guys have to help a customer saying, okay, I know, where I wanna, I know what I want to do. I might not know from the beginning on how to get there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like your car analogy. I actually use a, a diet analogy, which is I can read all the diet books that I want, but as I actually do something, I change my actions, it's gonna just be interesting information. So there's a, a way that we're advancing our technology in analytics. So most often people think about our reporting dashboards analysis still very vital for the strategic management reporting that we do. Where the next step is really on their journey uh, is from that Cognos business intelligence world to predictive, so SPSS software technology. That's gonna help look and identify patterns that human eyes may not see make correlations, and then predict the future. So that's the SPSS software portfolio, helping to answer what could uh, happen. The very next step after that is to put that together with business rules and say, uh, what do I want to happen? So what should be the next best action? That's using SPSS technology, iLog technology to bring that together. And then all the way to Watson, which we know is really the cognitive. Can I learn uh, what's best to, from the past? And can I take that learning to make my uh, decisions be more right more often? So there's a whole portfolio of analytics technology and a journey that clients are going on to go from historical views to look, looking at the future and then actually uh, determining how to uh, change the outcome for the better. So Harry, we've seen IOD evolve o over the years and, <clears throat> and last year we made the statement that IBM has essentially super glued its, its uh, analytics business to the big data meme. You know, so you saw the Hadoop movement um, mm -hmm. grow up, you guys observed that and then brought your portfolio to bear. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about how that decision came about to sort of how you essentially have created a new category, big data analytics. Now everybody's talking about it, but they weren't a year ago even. It's amazing how fast things change in this, <laughs> in this space, but I wonder if you could take us back and, and talk about the decision that you guys made to, to actually approach the market that way, and I'd like to talk about the marketplace a little bit too. Oh, sure, so the, um, the, the keynote this morning said it very nicely, which is big data is like uh, my, my muscles that don't go to the gym, they need to be exercised, and it's analytics that exercises it. So you can have all the data in the world, but if you don't have good analytics to make sense of it, it's kind of useless. You can have the best analytics, sophisticated algorithms in the world, but if you don't have data to fuel it, 
you're not going to get the right decision out of it. So really, we saw the marriage very early on. You need to put big data and analytics together. And you mentioned Hadoop. That's a great example. We have Infosphere Big Insights, a great technology, four times faster than other uh, uh, Hadoop distributions out there, great technology. We've married that together with our products from the SPSS portfolio, something like Analytic Catalyst. People worry about they have to code things, they have to have data scientists. Well, Analytic Catalyst, you point it at Big Insights, and it's going to give you English language interpretation. It's going to let the data do the talking. It's just a fantastic sort of marriage to put our big data technologies together with analytics. So how do you guys look at the, at the market, the, 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 the TAM? You've got all kinds of different players. You've got large companies like your, yourself. You know, Oracle's now sort of embracing the big data. You've got, you got the, the sort of pure play elephants, we sometimes call them, guys <laughs> like Cloudera and, and Hortonworks and others. You've got some small players emerging. What's, what's IBM's you know, perspective on, on the developments in the marketplace? How do yep. you look at it? So we see ourselves very, very unique. So yes, there's definitely the sort of mega vendors out there, right, which are looking to almost um, tie our customers into a particular stack. So they're tying them to the Oracle stack, the SAP stack. What we want to do is we want to say, look, you've got to take an outcomes-driven approach. It starts with a business problem. You need analytics and you need big data and you need infrastructure that understands those workloads. However, we recognize clients already have an existing investment. So we want to work with what clients already have. We want to expand their technology footprint, their IT foundation, with it streams or with Hadoop or with better data warehousing to be, be better performance. So start with what people have expand to address that business problem and grow from there. So we believe we have a very different position to the other mega vendors who are really looking for everybody to shift to their technology. Yeah, so one of the aspects of what you just mentioned is, is openness. You know, open, the word open used to be, a, you know, it's changed over the years, right? I, Lou Gerstner called you guys a recovering alcoholic when it came <laughs> to you know, some things like locking customers in. Uh, we were at a meeting last week. Uh, we heard uh, Joe Tucci, one of your you know, competitors at one of the big companies, essentially say we're the, you know, the open company. Those guys, you know, pointing at you and Oracle and, and, and others, are the closed guys trying to get people into the stack. So you're saying, no, that's not the case. Now, to talk, let's talk about more detail about that. So you're basically approaching openness as through open APIs, um, open standards. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Because as a customer, you get confused. Everybody's pointing fingers saying, oh, we're open, they're closed. And we're open, they're closed. What gives you confidence that you know, you're open. Yep, so we do um, a, a number of things in our technology to make sure we're open. First of all, we are, are large contributors to um, open source and open stack. So we have got investments around um, contributing to the open source community and we're very serious about our investments there. Secondly, we have um, open APIs and uh, open things like Big SQL against uh, Hadoop, which uh, everybody can use uh, what they have invested. So our openness is really around IT have got serious investments already in their IT shop. We understand that. We're not looking for them to uh, replace what's working for them. We're looking to be able to flesh out what they need in order to address a business problem. Because big data and analytics, it's not going to be one technology. It's not going to be one type of analytics that's going to solve a business problem. It's the ability to use them all in combination that's key. Harry, we were just in uh, New York City for our Big Data NYC event. There was a lot of announcements. It was pretty geeky as, and as you were talking about Hadoop and things like that. Um, but we're seeing the, 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 the early adopters cross over to not just production, scaling, say, Hadoop or, or other big data and analytics uh, to get that real-time piece. And then behind that is the followers, right? They're going to come in the second wave, uh, which is massive adoption. So one, do you agree that you're seeing those early sets of adopters scaling uh, into production? Because some of the use cases are, are, are showing their showing their hand, um, or not. And two, what is the use cases that you see right now for businesses that are the step one, the kindergarten, elementary school, where they are going to have business value? They're the they're the low hanging fruit for the use cases. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, clients out there. I would call it kicking the tires. So there's a tremendous amount that you can download and try for yourself in terms of testing out uh, your skill sets, testing out Hadoop. Uh, we have uh, the ability to download our technology as well for people who are just kind of trying it out for themselves. Now, where those projects um, get stuck is they, they're in that pilot phase, but really how do you put them into production? And that's where the, the specific high value use cases come in. 
So we see a lot of customers focused in two main areas. The first is around understanding the customer, customer lifetime value, customer retention, understanding how to deliver a superior customer uh, experience. And that's where uh, we can bring together the technology in order to address that particular domain. The second area is in operations, so the ability to sort of streamline and gain efficiency in operations. So uh, we have a signature solution, particularly around our uh, predictive uh, maintenance. So uh, cars, factory lines, you want to predict when they're going to fail and put the maintenance in right there before it fails, because it's extremely costly uh, to jump in and fix something once it's broken. So predictive maintenance. It's kind of concept, right, that we've been hearing about the industrial internet or internet of things, right? the equipment, the machine-to-machine -machine data? Yes, and the great thing is if you're at the conference, you can go down and see the connected car, where the connected car will be telling you, hey, it's the person in front of you slowing down, you should put on your brakes. In fact, it may put on the brakes for you automatically in the future. It's gonna be connected in that we, are, we can uh, track uh, hundreds of thousands of sensors about where that car is, how that car's feeling <laughs> as an internet of, uh, of a thing, and uh, be able to bring it in for service, be able to tell people how to run it efficiently. And then insurance companies are using that data to say, you know, what's the insurance rate going to be for a driver of that nature? If they're a, a speeder maybe, or if they're a, a, a dangerous driver, we can adjust insurance rates for, for that example. Harry, where do you see the demand for these technologies, these initiatives coming from within organizations? Is it the traditional I IT department? Is it the, the business, you know, people put out the, I think it was Gartner put out the data, the CMO is gonna spend more than the CIOs, right? Good, good fodder, good discussion points, and there seems to be legitimately a lot of action outside of the IT organization. What are you seeing? So this is where we, uh, we see the big data analytics coming together. To an IT person who's talking about big data, they're normally talking about big data and the analytics that apply to it. They're using big data almost as shorthand. And a lot of IT people are looking at um, how can I use the new technologies in big data to really uh, gain economies in IT, as well as better treat the data how it wants to be treated, which is if it's unstructured, it likes to stay unstructured. That's why you, Hadoop exists. You don't need to model it. If it's streaming, I want to act on it when it's streaming. If it's to be stored and modeled, I want a warehouse to do that. So IT are looking at the technologies in big data to flesh out the IT infrastructure. But you're right. The business side of the house may not be calling it a big data project. They may actually be calling it an analytics project, but they mean big data because they want more data in their analytics project. Or a new revenue project, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so, so what do you say to the CIO who maybe, maybe seen this, you know, this movie before? He or she is a skeptic. Right, they've, they've made technology investments, maybe they haven't panned out, this is a, a big trend, they read the Gartner hype cycle, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they say, you know what, I'm just gonna sit back and, and wait. Good idea, bad idea, why or why not? So um, I don't know that waiting is a, a good approach. Uh, it's, it's a strategy, like, just not a exactly. very good one? Is that it's what you're like saying? I, me waiting for the next possible best uh, iPhone. I might as well just have a phone I can use right now. So the, uh, the place that we, we say to start is look for a part in your business that can get a dramatic return from investment. And we look at three main areas. First off, are there areas of my business that if I could provide more complete answers, I'm going to be able to make better decisions. So I may already be making good decisions today, but can I fuel that with more insight, with more data, with um, better, more sophisticated analytics? Can I get more complete answers? The second error is where can I improve business processes by applying big data and analytics to that business process? Can I reduce my, uh, my uh, follow-up on, on fraud by automating some of the fraud that, may, that isn't important and only having the people following up on fraud on the pieces that are going to provide good value. So can I tune my resources and business processes to be better um, deployed? The third area is actually whole new business model. So I'll go back to your couponing example. So a telco is always interested in how to retain customers and how to provide better services on those mobile devices. We see now new business models appearing between telcos and retail to say, well, if I could partner up in a new business model between my mobile device and my retail store, I can offer coupons knowing where that mobile device is, knowing the person's walking past the store, and offer them something to incent them to go into the store. So we see whole new business models happening because of this ability. Because of the real-time nature of what you can exactly. do today versus what, you know, I mean, in the early days, you remember the early days of decision support, right? Some of these, these three, not the third one, not the new business models, but certainly the more complete 
answers. The, remember the 360 degree view of the, your business and to a certain extent business process improvements through, through analytics. Those were sort of promises of the old, old analytics business. The new analytics business you know, is promising even more, new, new business model changes. What gives you confidence that we'll actually see that vision this time through? I, I have confidence in it because we're already seeing it today at customers in that the uh, tr sort of traditional, let's say traditional analytics was in that manager's hands, right? I'm gonna monitor the business, I'm gonna see if I'm performing against my metrics for the business. But we're now seeing analytics in the actual business processes themselves. So we have a trucking company, they're actually providing analytics to the drivers. Where's the best price for petrol? Where's the best location? You should be stopping now for your, your rest stop. Mm -hmm. So we're actually seeing people put analytics into the hands of people you would not have thought about even five years ago. You would be able to enable those people. And they're not thinking of themselves as information workers or I'm going to stop to make a decision it's now. Doing the job. It's doing a job. <laughs> there's no longer um, a difference between analytics and operations. There's analytics and there's analytical operations. Uh, we have some questions coming up in our crowd chat here. Um, the crowd captain is going to be proud of Tim. Tim, good job out there. He's participating. Uh, he says, if a company could improve business process or value, why wouldn't they have been done, done it before? Has tech slash big data really been the hurdle? So there's a, a couple of reasons why people haven't done it before. I said, actually, I, I love it that question. It wasn't possible before. <laughs> <laughs> one. Well, <laughs> databases, one, right? I mean, why not? Okay. One, one was the data may not have been captured before, right? We were all chit-chatting before and talking on our mobile devices before, but now we can capture everything that's happening on Twitter and Facebook. So sometimes the data just wasn't available. Secondly, it was uh, cost prohibitive to actually take advantage of that data. So new um, infrastructure, uh, new database storage, new file system storage have made it more cost effective to actually pursue that data and make sense of it. And third, the technology and analytics has advanced. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not a statistician that can identify correlations and sentiment and text. I need technology to do that. So the technology has advanced to do it too. So I think it's just that we're at the cusp of things are now possible that weren't possible before. That's why everyone talks about the, we're in early days or bottom of the first inning, whatever analogy people want to use. Um, really, it's, it's all three, right? The instrumentation capabilities just weren't always there in real time. And, and Dr. Tim Buckman was saying that one of the most important things that they look at is the accuracy of the data. And he made metaphors to the airline industry. So those three things kind of have been the perfect storm. So I got to ask you, um, uh, in, in respect to the technology, you have many cases evolving in real time. So there's some low hanging fruit, we talked about that. Uh, but the technology theater, things are happening really quickly. So how do you, as a, as a company, IBM balance that? There's some stack discussions going on on crowd chat. So is it the right stack? Open, closes. The iPhone of the data center, open, Android, iPhone analogies. So you got technology changing very, very fast, and use cases are evolving, where some say the risk is that you could be at the, in a cul-de-sac with no customers. So you know, it's a challenge. How do you guys balance that? Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, every IT person I think is here who worries about agility and the amount of expenditure they have to invest in new projects versus maintaining or keeping the, 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 the shop up and running. So we care a lot about agility. And one way to have agility is to, and we advise clients to do this, which is invest in a big data and analytics platform, but do it one project at a time. You're not going to solve, remember the whole SOA, SOA of <laughs> 10 years ago, you know, I'm going to re-architect everything from the ground up. That's just not reality today. What we want to do is we want to say, have a roadmap or a mental map of where you're heading and the infrastructure and foundation you need for that. It's not that you're going to implement it all day one. It's that you want to, you want to take each project on a roadmap by design, not just let it happen to you. And that's going to give you agility because you're not just building for one project. I'm building for my customer center. Now I'm building for my operations. Now I'm building for finance. You're building a foundation with your first project that you can just expand from project to project, and that's where you get the return. So talk about the shadow IT market, because Dave and I have been talking about this for many, many years now. Um, shadow IT, this is the term where IT goes around their own processes to go play in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, and what's been interesting is, is that it's become almost legit, and a kind of don't ask, don't tell policy, where you can get stuff done, you can do things in there and, and be agile, where there's not a lot of reconstruction going on. And so you, people are seeing those use cases of, hey, I can go into the cloud, and if it breaks, I don't have collateral damage with infrastructure. So that notion of being agile, not just test and dev, moving apps in, in, into the crowd. Has, so, so comment on one, if you see that, and two, 
where does the integration, because the conversation around integrated stacks always comes in, at what point does the application have what components of the data fabric? So yeah. shadow IT is an experiment for agile. Has that going to impact IT? Will it become legitimate? And two, where does the analytics sit in the application? Okay, so that's a quite a big topic for a few take, minutes. Take, <laughs> so get the, some time. <laughs> so uh, in terms of IT, I actually believe we're at the cusp of uh, redefining the definition of IT. And IT, I feel, is very much right now defined as I'm in, uh, responsible for what's inside my organization. I'm responsible for keeping those systems up and running, delivering applications myself through that test dev production. If we look at IT as redefining themselves as saying, I'm here as a business partner to deliver the systems, the applications, the data to my business, regardless of whether it's in my house, it's on the cloud, or it's actually in partnership with someone else and their IT infrastructure, then I think that we don't no longer call it shadow IT. We call it a definition that IT's responsibility is to empower the business, and they're doing it from a combination of internal systems, systems on the cloud, and partner systems. So that's your, your first question, which is I don't see it as shadow IT, I see it as an expansion of the definition of IT. So it's becoming legitimized, and in different yeah. ways, not like go, you know, go do things legitimate with the credit cards, but like as part of the business process. You're yes, that. yes. Okay. Now, in terms of discretionary spend or shadow systems popping up because technology is very easy for uh, a business person to maybe source them themselves and not go via IT for the requirement setting, that is actually providing IT some of the agility that they're sort of lacking or still trying to catch up on, which is if there's a cloud application that can satisfy a business need, it shouldn't be seen as potentially as a threat to IT. We should be embracing it as part of the portfolio the business demands, otherwise they wouldn't be really looking for it. Where it comes down, and what you point out is, we need to be able to integrate those applications in with the IT systems in the shop to take advantage of them. So there's a lot of work that's happening right now to say there's Twitter data, there's cloud data, there's um, data sitting in apps that the business side of the house have acquired or a, 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 a buying a software as a service. We need to bring that data into the fold, as I said, step by step, and then deliver it as a whole. So people always talked about data as a one-way street. It was from systems to people, and then people do something magical with it. We're really seeing now it's a two-way street. The data that's happening in the business, the systems happening on the cloud, they need to come back into the fold and be integrated. And our technology and our information integration will help make that happen. And we're seeing that same trend where essentially it's like, the customers see the destination point A to point B, but a lot of the times their question that they really need to be asking comes after a few tries. The real question is, okay, we now know after, it's like Google search almost, it's like not like a pre-canned uh, queries in the old days, remember the old days. So, so we're seeing you know, companies like Splunk and other companies where, hey, here's some machine data. We say, you know, in trash to gold, you know, which is log files, which that now is insight. So mm -hmm. you, what you guys have is the same concept, where you can bring data in and integrate it up into the applications. That's is that what you guys, is that a good explanation? Yes, yes, I think that the challenge that companies have is that right now that there's this golden nugget in the data, but we don't know what is a byproduct of the business in terms of data, or what's a co-product in that I can leverage some of that data value. So people have become hoarders of data, right? It's almost like a competition. How much data can <laughs> I That's a reality hoard? show. We should, be on, we should get on that with our, with <laughs> yeah, our yeah, yeah. The data hoarders. <laughs> the data hoarders. <laughs> but really, the, the piece that's lacking is that I don't see it as a I have too much data problem. I see it as I don't have a good enough filter for that data. I don't have enough filters in order to be able to understand what's valuable in it and what insight I can gain from it. My final question for you is much more of a personnel question. Is you know we talk about you know data exhaust to data gold, and that's some of the the real innovators have done that have taken what looks like data exhaust um, or pollution, if you want to look at it that way, in a negative way, and turned it into real value or gold. So, uh, question, final question is, what are you seeing in the innovators out there? What's the makeup of the folks that are the ones that are seeing the early opportunities around taking data, not just hoarding it, but like turning it into value? Uh, do you see a new kind of executive, a new kind of uh, personnel category, whether it's a data scientist? I mean, what is some of the, share with the folks some of the, 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 the insight around the kind of personnel, the person that's making things happen? Well, I, I think some of the, uh, the people who are actually making it happen may not like this analogy, <laughs> but I say uh, the people that are really making it happen are thinking like six-year-olds. And let me explain why. <laughs> so they're thinking like six-year-olds because if you have a small child, they, uh, they get to that age where every question is why. 
why, 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 why this, why that, why that, and quite often they eventually get told because. And really the people who are innovating in this market with big data and analytics are the people that are constantly questioning. So they're like a six-year-old, they constantly question, and they're not just gonna say it's because, because we always did it that way, because that's the way the industry runs, because that's the way that we work with inside this organization. The people who are really successful, they break free from that, and they're gonna be constantly questioning the status quo, constantly saying, I don't know what I don't know, and they're gonna use big data and analytics to get to that answer. That's great, Harry, great. And you know, we'll end on that note, uh, you know, we're in a toddler industry right now, we're asking why. <laughs> um, <laughs> We can have a quiz show, ask the fifth, who's smarter than a fifth grader? We'll get Watson on here to, to compete. Uh, but big data is changing the world from exhaust to value. We're, we're, we're seeing it all over. This is really about a business value with analytics on one hand and social business on the other with all the technology underneath. Uh, great uh, sound bites on crowdchat.net. Harry, thanks for joining us. We'll be right back here in the Cube at live at Information On Demand, IBM's conference. Hashtag IBM IOD. We'll be right back. <laughs>